Hi, this is your intrepid traveler, Robert Smith, on location in Pumamarca, just outside of Oizatambu in Peru. Today, we're going to uncover some mysteries about the ancient site Pumamarca. Very little is known about this location because there hasn't been much in terms of research. But I believe we found out what the purpose of the site was, who the people were who lived here, and finally, we will reveal our discovery about the animal that the structure represented. So let's make our way up to Pumamarca ruins and see what we can find. The best way to get up to Pumamarca is to take the Colectivo in the central of the town and that'll bring you up to the trailhead Pumamarca. As you can see, you're gonna pass Pukyo terraces, which are fantastic, and you can catch them on the way back. What I did was I made friends with the local folks and I was throwing Spanish around. They helped me get to the trail. Uh, off I went. You can see some of the, the nice faces. Being able to interact like that in a personal way with the ancestors of the people who lived in these valleys for literally thousands of years. Just to feel their energy, it's one of the things that makes this area special in general. And what? Um, is that the local, local people? This is my amigo aquí. I'm doing What is your name? Ruben. Huh? Ruben. Ruben. And, hope, and the other uh, passengers here, all locals living in the mountains, heading up uh, on, the, on, this, on this crazy mountain road. Here at the trailhead, grandmother's going to carry her supplies up into the mountains. The majority of people who live in this area speak only the ancient language of their ancestors, Quechua. This local farmer, he led me up the trail, big jug of chicha in his right hand. And being able to talk with him for 45 minutes on the way up, I learned about what the neighbors were doing what crops were growing, information about Puma Marca. I talked about the languages spoken. It was fantastic. This trail is probably a couple of thousand years old, but uh, one nice thing is I've been able to talk to some of the folks commuting, literally commuting on this on their road, because people live back in these mountains. I ran into two guys who, uh, who were traveling four hours each way. Whew. Super Basico, living just like their ancestors did thousands of years ago. I have traveled all over the world exploring ancient archaeological sites, with my primary interest being who lived there, what kind of lives they led, and what knowledge they possessed. Particularly, how their societies functioned, what were their challenges, and how they accomplished what they did. From structures, art, to science, agriculture, religion, and astronomy. And for many reasons, the peoples of the Andes are extremely unique in the world, both for their incredible success in this harsh geography and for their amazingly advanced societies living and flourishing in these same difficult conditions. Here I am in the middle of the Andes Mountains in some obscure valley on top of this ridge in this area called Puma Marca, occupied a thousand or more years ago. But just being here knowing that there is whole civilization in this area, families and entire lives, and they thought it was this was the center of the earth for them. But in fact, and as we definitely know, it was not the center of the planet. In the beginning of the video, we talked about the discoveries. Who had lived here? What was the purpose of the structure? But before we get into that, what don't we know about Puma Marca? In the case of this location, very little is known. There is little or no evidence that sheds light on what the site was. There have been no studies of the site, and most information is just conjecture or just plain incorrect. So what we don't know is a lot. What do we know about Puma Marca? Or perhaps I should say, what we discovered and then concluded based on our findings. This is definitely a pre-Inca site. It was more than likely built and occupied by either the Wari culture, 600 to 1100 AD, or the Kilki culture, 900 to 1200 AD. The Wari occupied the Cusco area for about 400 years, as well as vast area of what is modern day Peru, particularly in the South and Central Andes and coastal regions. Thus, many of the characteristics of the Inca empire are derived from the Wari terraces, buildings, temple design, agriculture, and canal systems. However, there was also evidence of another culture that lived in the valley, the Kilki. We know little about this culture except for unique pottery and building structures. The design and layout of Pumarca does not match typical Wari architecture, thus leading to the supposition that it was built by the Kilki, who are known to have occupied much of the area surrounding Oyatatambu and beyond. So, the bottom line is, I suspect that the Kilki constructed and occupied Pumamarca at some point, but more than likely, they were not the only peoples to have lived in this important juncture in the valley. The construction is very different than any other location in the valley as far as the layout and design of the buildings, walls, and other structures. 
Further evidence of this is in extensive terracing systems, or as locals call them, andenes. One interesting aspect of this area is the extensive terracing network that spreads literally all across this entire mountainside and perhaps further I'm not sure the reason I say this is interesting is because the construction of the walls as you can see are very short it's the shortest I have seen anywhere in the valley and it's a good demonstration that uh, their ancient Inca pre-Inca cultures were utilizing terracing well before the Inca showed up Pumamarca was assuredly a living fort, or perhaps we can call it a fortified city, as has existed throughout the world in ancient times to protect the residents from hostile incursions. What are the ingredients that allow me to come to this conclusion? First, the design is of a defensive, protective nature, surrounding a huge open area within, as well as several, approximately 15 buildings, that could have easily been designed for residential purposes. Furthermore, the actual location of the site is the highest in the buildable area. The east side of the site comes up to a vertical 40 meter drop off. Behind this drop, but still outside of the main structure, there are several stone watch buildings. 30 to 40 meters behind these, the city's walls start. On the southwest side of the city, which is left, is the most exposed and less steep. Although still at a high angle to the top, there are a series of terrace walls that would offer initial lines of defense. And then the main city walls, which are the tallest and thickest stone walls on any side. All walls are made at a 90 degree angle to the next section. I'm convinced of the military nature of the structure and how it was built. That doesn't mean it's its only purpose. Perhaps any ancient city had protective walls for the residents in the case of invaders. But uh, what I'm talking about is look at the 90 degree angle wall system all along here. And then the steep face in the front here. So if you had enemies coming in at you from this direction, up close to the wall, you could still deal with them from the sides. Why do I call this a living fort? Well, it's obvious that lots of people were living and working near this walled city. They are huge, open, flat areas in the valley below, on three sides, where big valleys and rivers come together. This, of course, allowing for very productive agricultural operations. In fact, these valleys are still growing crops today in both valleys. It is fantastic to see the ancestors of the original people working the land by hand, and in many cases, using the exact techniques and tools as has been done for thousands of years. But there is more. The hills surrounding, as well as slopes heading down to the valley from the sites, are still covered in terraces. A huge mound half bowl filled with still standing and still functioning terraces that are being used by farmers and still being watered by the ancient water canal systems. This quantity of growing area, both on the hillsides and in the immediate valleys, could support a significant population, and they had to live somewhere. I'm not suggesting that they all lived in the fort. On the contrary, they, like their European or Asian peasant farmer counterparts, lived and worked outside the castle wall, while the rich and famous lived inside the facility where they lived in stone rather than buildings made of mud and thatch, which is what the majority of the local population was living in. And again, like their worldwide peasant counterparts, they probably had a pecking order of who got fort access when an attack was underway. I was imagining what it must have looked like when it was fully in operation. Houses everywhere, organized and active terraces being worked by thousands of farmers. The sounds, smells, and activities of a large community. When I'm at these sites, I always wish I could travel back in time to see what it was really like in full action. As to why the buildings are on one side of the structure, covering approximately 15% of the compound, is unclear. My guess is the open area was filled with non-stone structures. They could have been used as storehouses, workshops, military barracks, or perhaps all of the above. In addition, I am sure there would have been open space just like this in any community environment. It would be great to do some excavation on the site to see what is under the ground. The location in general at the conjunction of the Parachancha and Yorkmayo river valleys and relatively gently sloping hills that surround this area were clearly of practical and strategic importance. Practical for the reasons we have mentioned and strategic from a trade and defensive standpoint. There was trade and commerce through the mountains and into the jungle community. We know there was trade because products and goods from all over the Andes, the jungles, and even from the seas circulated throughout the valley kingdoms. As far as Pumamarca being a defensive position, it would have been an early warning system to the much more populated Urubamba Valley, just 10K from the site. And considering the sheer size and importance of the Urubamba Valley area, it would have been a necessary precaution to stop invading armies 
from pouring down into the valley from the north. Plus, from this point to Oitatambu, there were vast areas of valley floor and terraces on the mountainsides being used to grow food and house a robust population. So, Pumamarca was connected with every other city and community in the area, and more than likely in the entire Sacred Valley and beyond. And this was the case well before the Inca showed up, and then, when they did take over, this community continued to flourish. I'm not implying that the Incas didn't control this area and location and more than likely administer whatever rules and regulations were necessary, but it is interesting to note that there is no evidence of any architecture, buildings, canals, etc. that is indicative of Inca influence. So my assumption is the people that were there when the Inca showed up remained there and paid their taxes like every good Roman should. As I mentioned before, there are many terraces surrounding Pumamarca. And unlike the more carefully built terraces closer to Ollantaytambo, the terraces at Pumamarca are smaller height-wise, roughly built, and use the same type and size stones as the city wall. Yet another hint that these were built much earlier than the arrival of the Incas. Absent are the tight-fitting stones, flying stairs, large boulders built into the walls at various points. So, the critical mission of these important terrace structures was simple, provide food, and lots of it. To name a few, they grew corn, potatoes, quinoa, tomatoes, avocados, strawberries, and much more. As promised, it's time to reveal the discovery we made at Pumamarca. The outlying walls that surround the city are in the shape of a hawk. It's well known that the Incas built structures in representation of animals and food, particularly in relation to the constellations in the sky. And if you look at this structure, the outline, this is clearly a bird. Pre-Inca civilizations were also designing structures and representations of animals, as was the case of Puma Marca, where this large, thriving community built this important structure, not only for practical reasons, but also out of respect and reverence with the other living creatures they shared this valley kingdom. You know, it wasn't until very recently that we had Google Earth, so perhaps I am the first person to notice it. And quite frankly, I think if people knew it was, this would be a more important site. But for me, I prefer to visit sites off the beaten path and allowing for me to make my own discoveries, which is exactly what happened at Puma Marca. So, what did we learn and discover about Puma Marca? Well, Although more than likely not the only culture to live in this area, the Kilki civilization constructed and occupied this important strategic location. In addition, this was a pre-Inca site that was operated as a central city fort, supporting the surrounding population from an administrative, government, military, and trading hub standpoint. Like anywhere in the world, this was the city center, and like any city of history, was fortified for protection of hostile invaders. The Inca definitely would have controlled and influenced this city and surrounding areas, and perhaps had administrators directly take over operations. But for the most part, I suggest this site was already a productive and bustling city when the Inca showed up. And instead of destroying and conquest, Incas absorbed and benefited from what had already been going on for more maybe than a thousand years in the successful and thriving community of Pumamarca. And of course, we made the exciting discovery that the shape of Pumamarca is that of a bird. There is so much to see at this wonderful location, and it really gives what I consider an authentic feel of what it must have been like for the people who had lived here thousands of years before. With a little creativity, power of observation, and a sprinkle of common sense, this could very well be one of your favorite locations to visit while traveling in Peru. If you have any questions or comments at all, please feel free to include them in the comment section below. Your interpret traveler.